Welcome to the Effects Loop. I'm Chris. I'm Marissa. I'm Diaz. And I'm Adam. And we're keeping you in the loop of the guitar community. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Stringjoy. Uh, Stringjoy makes amazing strings. Um, I use them. Chris uses them. Scott uses them. Uh, I don't know. Adam, have you ever used them? I have not, but I, I, I hear you good things. <laughs> yeah, mostly because we put it in the notes. But um, <laughs> it just uh, that's the our notes. It just there. says string joy, good things. No, so if you want good strings and some good things, you should uh, check out String Joy. Go to stringjoy.com. Uh, they do custom sets, which is probably one of the coolest things. Uh, half mm-hmm. half gauges, crazy stuff like that. Um, and we also did an episode with Scott from String Joy, so you can always look back and check that out. Uh, yeah. so, Another cool thing is oh. they will actually help you pick out a set. So if you're not sure what you need for like a custom set, send them an email. And you don't even have to send them a bribe either. That's a yeah. lot cheaper now. So just do it. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that goes into what's new. Uh, Chris, anything new going on with you? Um, I survived uh, swapping out my first electrical outlet today. And... F- it has me concerned for the rest of the wiring in my house because the ground wire was not connected to anything. Nice. <laughs> that dirty power. So, that's how you get all the good tone. Yeah, that, that explains why I've had like so much like buzz and stuff in the house. Yep. So, all right. So Marissa, anything new with you? No. All right. That's easy. That uh, Diaz. <laughs> I always forget. Like I always like, I don't know. Maybe all my new gear stuff has like blurred together. Uh, uh, did you sell anything? I did. Did you sell? I've got, well, I've got a bunch of stuff up for sale right now, actually. Um, oh, and that reminds me, I've got to do this really cool thing. Um, so Sinusoid, great company, great guys. Uh, Albert, who works for Sinusoid, uh, his family got hit hard and a lot of his friends, and that's where he's from, is from the panel from Panama City. And they're actually doing a cable that's for sale right now. Um, if you're listening to the, like back on this, it's probably not for sale, but you know, one of the things they do on these big disasters, stuff like that is they make a special cable and they donate Mm -hmm. proceeds to help those people. So go check that out. I've actually got my, uh, boss PH two up for sale. Uh, and when I sell it, all the money is going towards that. Um, but that was my, I almost forgot that I was supposed to do that. Um, but yeah, I sold my G 70, my wireless system. I, th- I think that okay. was like kind of last week, but I've got a bunch of stuff up for sale because I'm still riding that HX effects train pretty hard. <laughs> nice. And, then, right, and uh, Adam. Yeah, I would actually just say uh, the first sinusoid cable I ever bought was for the Houston uh, yeah. hurricane and uh, high quality cable. Uh, I use the two that I bought uh, all the time. And uh, so if you can, uh, if you need a cable or if you just have the ability to buy one and, you know, you can always use an extra cable, go, uh, go over to Sinusoid and check out. And if they've, if they're not doing that anymore, if you're listening back, uh, just buy a different cable from them. So mm-hmm. there you go. Uh, yeah. New, I got a, a line six power cab and a Blackbird mini pedal board, which are not related pieces of gear, but uh, it was <laughs> cool to be able to check out both of them. Uh, when I got them in, one I'm going to keep and one I'm going to flip. So oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Which <laughs> are we wait, leaving wait, wait. that up to a uh, mystery? <laughs> hold on, this is kind of crazy. Hold on, we forgot to say who Adam is. Everyone's just like, "Who's Adam?" We just randomly replaced Scott. This is now Adam. So <laughs> this is actually so. This is Adam Dolhanic. Um, if you're in a lot of the groups we're in, um, you've seen him around. Uh, Adam, what's your nickname for uh, on Sixty Cycle Home? Uh, the inboxer he is the inboxer because i think he was the like the main person who actually sent them emails in the early days yeah i, I yeah. was yeah. Uh, driving a lot of ads uh yeah <laughs> you you were the ad king at one point um but adam d- has been you know he's done stuff with uh, the church collective he's a contributor there he's on their podcast fairly often i think you said you were just on this past week for them right uh, i believe what is as of as of this date the most current one i am on Okay. Okay. Most current one. And then you also do, uh, man, I'm going to miss that word conferences with them as well. Yeah. Um, I've, I haven't gotten out to the East coast conference yet, but I am, uh, 
I'm pretty firmly, I guess, a fixture now at the West Coast Conference, mm -hmm. uh, which is weird for me because I am the world's okayest guitar player, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm not a pro. And there's this one time of year where I get to go to like it's like going to band camp, mm -hmm. and I get flown to California, and I get to spend a weekend uh, just playing music and talking about guitar, and Tell it's like it's like my fantasy camp. If they want live coverage, <laughs> I'll be more than happy to be flown out to California <laughs> and sit and hang out with Adam for a few days, but uh, or however long it is. is. I'm guessing it's probably is it a few days or just one day? Yeah, I'm. I'm usually. I think this last year I was down there, um, Friday to Monday. Okay, that's pretty cool. And then, but you're uh, like, you're actually a pastor, so you're turning into like the pastor who like plays guitar as well. And like they're gonna yeah. get a guitar player, and they're gonna be like, "Oh, here comes Pastor Adam. He's gonna want to play guitar again." <laughs> yeah, um, I, I hope not to be that guy. <laughs> we all know that guy, though. There's yes. always that one pastor. Oh yes, man. I can. I. I. As soon as I said it, I was like, I know exactly who that is. Yeah. And <laughs> then, uh, but uh, it, and also the funny thing about because Adam said he doesn't know if he's gonna flip stuff. Adam is like a habitual flipper. Like, I think you're addicted to it. It's kind of like gambling. Well, I don't know about addicted to it. It's how I buy stuff. So I, oh, I, yeah. I, it's like a job. I need to go to work. Yeah. And, uh, you're a, and, but you're like, what? Well, there was a show where people would always start with a small item and they had to flip up. Yeah. That, that's your, that's your thing. I like watch the, pe the, the pedals as they grow. You're like, you oh, yeah, cause didn't you like, like flip up to a Titan or something? Yeah. Cow. Is that you? He flipped up for, for a full a full cower. Yeah, yeah. I actually have. So I'm I'm looking at my two cowers right now that are paid for by flipping. <laughs> yeah, because you got the one the that has the, like kind of like the Pan Am design, didn't you? Yes, I have the Pan Am. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's I what mean, we should have talked about is <laughs> secrets to flipping. I, you know, what? <laughs> I feel like. I'm just gonna everyone should just send Adam a pedal and see what he can turn it into. And somehow we can get <laughs> somehow you can make some money off of it. Like I'll send you like a DS one and fifty bucks and you can send me a timeline back. <laughs> <laughs> uh no, nah, you know, it's just it takes time. And I part of doing the flipping is uh you have to be willing to get the small flip um mm -hmm. as much as the big flip. So I, I made a yeah. hundred bucks off of a off of a pedal recently. And the same week I made $10 off of a pedal. And last week I lost $5 on a pedal. So you have to be willing to kind of play the long game on that. So Adam's every once in a while, I'll put something up for sale and Adam will send me a message. And my first thought is this is totally not going to happen, but I'm going to see how far we can get with this negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's, it's there's it's true. I'm probably, times. so, so to, to end the surprise, I'm probably going to flip the uh, Blackbird pedal board. Okay. Because uh, as we're going to talk about later, I don't use pedals anymore. Um, and I always liked the idea of maybe using pedals again. But um, <laughs> I will say it was cool because I've heard of them for years. And it was neat to be able to get to see their build quality up front. And I'm impressed. Uh, I think they build a solid board. And um, it wasn't packed terribly well and survived the journey all the same. Um, <laughs> but the real reason I bought it is because it has a pedal power uh or a voodoo labs digital okay. as the pedal as the power supply. And I bought it for what the board is worth. And, and so really it's like, I got the, oh, nice. the power supply for 10 bucks and that's nice. the flip. Yeah. So Dude, that's awesome. Um, on the, you've, you've played probably a lot of cool gear then that's like, that'd be pretty cool. Cause you get to test all the stuff you get and you know, you I've to, tried a lot of stuff, uh, <laughs> because of the flipping. So has, have there been any pedals that you've gotten where it like, you don't even like take it out of the box. Like it's, it gets sent to you and it's already up for sale and you're like, you yeah. don't even touch it. Yes. Um, Is it because and, you've and owned it before or because like you just had no interest in it? Mostly it's because I've owned it before. Occasionally it's because I have no interest and rarely it's because I just, I would love to have, there are pedals I've gotten through that I wish I had had time and I just didn't. It sold quick and I was busy. And so, yeah, you know, there's there's only been one time I did that and I actually regretted it. Uh, I I got an RV five. Mm -hmm. I like I got a really good deal on it. I think I paid like it was it was before the RV six came out and everything. I think I paid like seventy bucks for it. And then I did that plus some cash for a blue sky, and that was before the big sky was out. Yeah. 
So that was that was probably the only time. But like the RV five didn't even get plugged in. And I kind of regret it because I should have given it a better like should have given it a shot. That that happened with a uh, MXR carbon copy, and to this day I've never played an MXR carbon copy. Oh man, <laughs> I know. that's a great pedal. That's what everybody says. You know what? But I can, I'll say this though: I've owned three of them, and I don't own one currently. Sure, I, I mean it's it's a great second delay. Um, but it's like the it's like the Boss DS one of delays. Like everyone's owned one at some point. Yes, it seems like everyone's yeah. owned one, and they've just. They never keep it. It's kind of like the full tone OCD. Like that's everyone's first like boutique drive. To slash See, distortion. I don't think I've owned either one of those. Or the full drive. Um, the yeah. full drive too. Yeah. So so the um, the Caroline Guitar Company, the the Haymaker, their overdrive pedal. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, I was talking to Philippe about it when it first came out, and he said that he considered it like the Scotty Pippen of overdrive pedals. That you've got your Michael Jordan, and uh-huh. you need that like number two guy. And that's how a lot of people are with delays. They want their primary delay. It usually has tap tempo. Maybe it's a timeline. Maybe it's um, a DD500 or a DD20. And then they want that second delay to be something different. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. an analog and they don't care that it doesn't have tap tempo. Uh, I think the Mm -hmm. kilobyte delay kind of fits in that in that vein they like um, they're like they know they can kick both on and get an ambient sound exactly and need, or it's like kind of like that that like a good lead guitar delay that yeah, doesn't like need to be in time yeah. um, i have my kilobyte delay it's the only pedal i i have never sold and it's always set to a very specific rhythm um sound that i just know i i know i can turn it on and it'll do that one thing so yeah, so the uh, the Blackbird's going to get flipped. So the power cab I'm going to keep, uh, but the power the, liking the power cab precipitated my posting my Benson Monarch amplifier for sale. So something's oh, wow. getting something's getting sold. It's just not the power cab. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. Oh, sorry. Awkward uh, moment. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I'm used. To, I'm sure so, what you were doing there. So, well, I was. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm we used to being the guy. Read. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, our, we only have a couple of things in news this week because I think we have a pretty good topic. Um, the first one is a sound Brenner, I believe is how it's pronounced, Core. It's a four-in-one smart music tool. Um, it can do vibrating metronome, uh, magnetic twist tuner. Why does it say twist tuner on here? It's a headstock tuner, essentially, like it magnetically clips to one of your tuners, which... For the price of 160 bucks, I would not trust, you know, clipping that no. to a headstock tuner no <laughs> at all. Um, but also has a decibel meter, and of course it does like a watch. But the thing that stood out to me was having that uh, decimal meter on there, because yeah, it kind of opens it up to, you know, like your sound guy, too. Oh, and well, and like, the sound guy can be like, uh, no, Brother Steven. It is not too loud. It is only eight yeah, nine decibels look. in here. Look at my watch. Brother Steven doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, brother Steven. It, it, it's Sister Karen that cares. Oh, yeah. Bless his heart. No, He's I just got... mean he doesn't care. You could, you could show him that it's it's only you know 80 or, or 60 decibels. He wouldn't care. It's, it's too darn loud. still too loud. Yeah. Get off my lawn. Yeah. It's a liter- the sound system literally off. It's still too loud. That's just your yeah. vein throbbing in your hearing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think it was. Well, yeah, so, think... so they like blasted. There was something close to this, or it might have been this product, or maybe another product by this company that was blasted on Facebook. It had to have been yeah, a, a few months two. ago. And like, they just, like, it was just everywhere. But it was a really cool thing. A lot of people were, it was one of those things where like, so, like your aunt is tagging you because she saw it. And because it said mm-hmm. musician, she's like, oh, yeah, Jonathan needs to know about this. But uh, uh, the other thing was the uh, shot just lost the name Uh, the pulse, which is a uh, hundred bucks. So if you got to think like, that's what the, did I say? 70, it's called the pulse, is 60, that 70 bucks more. Yeah, that's the other okay, thing that you probably thing. saw. Yeah, that's the thing that was like going this. Yeah, this seems really cool, though. It definitely is one of those. I don't know. I don't I couldn't see you wearing it all the time. I mean, I couldn't wear it all the time, but, um, no. like it's definitely a cool tool. Uh, I've always been kind of interested, like the pulse metronome. I don't know how I could handle, like how I would do with that. 
I mean, it'd be cool if it could, like, get synced up to, like, if you're running clicks or something, but I feel like there'd be some, like, delay in that getting synced up, so that could probably be a disaster. Can like, you come out with a watch where if you hit the wrong note, it's, like, electrically shocks you? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be in the version 3. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a new firmware coming out. <laughs> All right. No. Uh, so, do we have anything else to say about that before we move no. on? I, I think it just comes down to how accurate the, the decimal reader is and whether that's a gimmick or not. Because if it's if yeah. it's reasonably accurate, then it's I, worth it. I wonder how, it's, like, I wonder how just how someone could put semi decent. Yeah, I wonder, just with the technology we have today, I just couldn't imagine putting out a subpar decibel reader. Like, I, I don't feel like there'd be so much that would, like, jack the price up from, like, a, dis, yeah. you know, just to have a... Or even if there. it's within, like, 5 dB, that's not a huge difference. That even if it's reading, you know, short or high, that, I'll go that's stand behind a jet engine. Not a deal breaker. You know how close it gets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So the other thing we had to talk about is the Catalan bread. How do they say it was nye compressor? Adam actually pointed this out to us, so I'll let him talk about it a little bit if he wants to. Yeah, this is a super sad story in a way. Um, Nick Harris, who, um, and I think I think there's a reason they're they're making it clear that it's called the nye compressor because uh, I think a lot of people were con- thinking it was called the Nick compressor or the Nick Nick press or whatever, um, just mm-hmm. because. Of, of Nick Harris, but he was the founder and owner of Catalan bread pedals, um, who made so many, uh, pedals, the bell epoch and, um, the, uh, the Topanga, this, the Topanga, yeah, the Topanga, uh, which is my favorite of their pedals. Um, the semaphore, there's a bunch of, of, uh, the Galileo a bunch of, um, Oh yeah. The, really, the Galileo looks that, that thing yeah. nailed a nice queen town. Yeah. And, and really like around, let's say like 2010 to like 2014, they were kind of like some of the top dog innovators, all that stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, I think it was 2015. I was still living in California at the time. Uh, he's from Portland and he died tragically. There was a windstorm and a tree fell on his car as he was driving. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so real sad story. Um, uh, I know where, uh, I know where Catlin bread's offices are. Um, I go down to that area. Sometimes I live in Portland now. And, uh, uh, the story is that this was the last thing that he breadboarded, which is a, if you don't know what a breadboard is, it's basically where, uh, designers, um, put components and, and things to, to create a circuit before they put it in a pedal. And so this was the last thing he was working on. It's a, uh, it's an FET compressor and if you're trying to look for a comparison, you're only really talking about the Cali 76 compressor. Mm-hmm. Every other FET compressor on the market is pretty much a rack mounted unit. So um, it's a neat idea because there is a place in the market for an alternative to the Cali 76, and it's not mm-hmm. claiming to be a, uh, a UA 1176 clone, but there is a place in the market for more FET compression pedals. Yeah, because didn't um, uh, Bondi come out with one? Yeah. Um, they're, they're one of the ones, but there's not many if you, yeah, no, um, no, no, that was like, I think that's honestly like one of the only ones I can really think of because usually they're mostly based off of a Ross compressor or, yeah. uh, what's the orange squeeze that the orange squeeze is essentially the same thing as a Ross compressor, but it's different enough that, yeah. um, and if you, if you've ever been to, there's a website called, uh, Ovni labs, O V N I L lab.com um and he primarily focuses on bass guitar but he it's it's a website devoted to compression pedals and he has a wealth of information there and so you know for at the time of his writing he he breaks down like vca compressors are like your boss cs3 uh your maxons um and the keely limiting amplifier are all v- vca and then ota compressors are like the MXR, the Ross, the Dynacomps, the Keeley, the Wampler, and, and most boutique compressors. Um, so FET, there's definitely a place in the market for it. And it has an onboard EQ and gain control. So it actually might also be kind of a secret weapon uh, gain pedal. Um, the X Pandora circuit, which the JHS Kilt is based off of, is mm-hmm. functionally a compression circuit uh, that has gain involved. 
So, um, and the Effectrode Comp, which is an optical, uh, tube optical compressor, that has a really cool gain setting, so you can actually make it an overdrive. So, this could be a really fun and versatile pedal. I, th- I think it's a cool, if, you're, if this is going to be your last pedal, this is a cool way to go out. Yeah. No, it, and it definitely, like you said, it, it's hitting a part of the market. And I think, and that's like the big thing is people don't realize that how many different types of compression pedals there are, or how many different types of like compression styles. Like, I mean, there's, there's different stuff out there. Cause like the, uh, you said the limiting amplifier, um, and that's like the compressor pro, like there's different, yeah. there's different styles, you know, and, and like, this is pretty cool. I, I want to check one out. Yeah. I think, uh, compressor pro would be kind of a comparable, you know, if you're looking for a comparison in price point and all that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it's worth checking out. I think if, uh, you know, in six months when the used market starts hitting, uh, with them, I'll probably check one out and be good to go. Nice. All right. Uh, I lost our, uh, document. Here we go. Okay. We're on. I know I'm on, <laughs> it. I'm on it. Yeah. So yeah. our topic this week, uh, since, Adam has been, I think, in the digital realm for quite a while now, right? Uh, solidly six months. Okay, and then Diaz has also been in it uh, for quite a while. Yeah. So I'm, I'm we're going to have... Well. Yeah, so we're going to kind of have like them compare notes of like moving from analog to digital. That's and not Adam fair, because Adam actually he, has notes, like... Yeah, he really does have. So notes. Adam will be comparing notes. Yeah, he'll be seeing what Diaz uh, can pull out of his butt. <laughs> Listen, I, yes. I I know I'm not a smart man, so you're gonna actually hear yeah. smart stuff for once on this podcast. Besides stuff Scott yeah. says, but he's not. Here. Yeah, and I don't really have a like chicken in this fight or whatever because I'm still usually analog. So <laughs> I'm gonna be coming into this with like an open mind, and yeah. As long so as you really, our goal, to, our goal trying. is to convince you. Yeah, basically. We, so we need, have at it. We need to convince <laughs> Marissa to let you buy. That's it. Digital there gear. we go. Let's convince the boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so which is the real challenge there? Convincing me to go digital or convincing Marissa to let me get something? <laughs> well, that's a good no, question, Marissa. Marissa, what will it take? I don't care. See, that's the okay. whole thing. Like everyone thinks everyone wants to act like Marissa's gonna control them. Usually she's the one that's like, no, buy it, buy it. Yeah, she's the one that like buys things. Exactly. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> she I'm pretty sure she bought a guitar like right after we got off the air. I'm just yep. perpetuating stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> so um we talked about Adam like flipped a lot of gear. Adam, you've been known to play a lot of high end stuff. So you were talking about the Cali 76 you've owned probably more than any other human, probably more than <laughs> origin effects has owned somehow. <laughs> I have, I, I would, I would say f- safely. I have owned more. I, I've got to be in the top 10% of like owners. Yeah, no, you've you've owned quite a few. You owned one that I really wanted, but I just couldn't afford. I couldn't make happen. Yeah, you know yeah, exactly. I, the, <sighs> I know the one. So, yeah, the um, <laughs> I, I've had nice gear for a long time, and uh, it didn't start out that way. Um, you know what got me into nice gear was digital gear, and it was the Strymon Blue Sky, and yeah. th- the reason was that. I wanted, I needed an ambient, an ambient delay or an ambient reverb. And I also wanted a good amp spring kind of reverb. Mm -hmm. And because the amp I was playing at the time did not have reverb. And so I was getting ready to put two reverb pedals on my board. And then I did the math and I realized that a Strymon was cheaper. One blue sky was cheaper than buying the two, uh, to other pedals. So that's kind of what got me over the hump. Like once I got over the idea that yes, I could spend $300 on a pedal. Um, then with flipping, it kind of became, well, what, what can I get and what can I try? So, so I've had nice gear for, for a number of years now. Uh, did been you really flip fortunate before 60 cycle hum? Like were you flipping before you started listening or did they kind of spark that or very limited? Um, I had, I had flipped a King of tone, 
Okay. And I had flipped a, a small number of pedals. It was maybe like, it was maybe $10 or $15 flips. So I was aware of it in concept, but I didn't know how much I could do with it. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and 60 cycle hum definitely like put me in perspective on, um, how much I could do with it. Um, mm-hmm. but I would say the biggest contribution that that podcast gave to me was being okay with, uh, cheap gear, which is the, the, the ironic thing. Um, yeah. but when you're okay with cheap gear, there were times where I would have the nicest version of whatever pedal sell it and get a very good cheap version so that I could fund something else. Mm-hmm. And that kind of cleared the road for me. Well, yeah, because you where you landed before you went really digital was very high end stuff. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure you still own some of it, but you've owned how many? You've owned a few Benson amps, haven't you? Uh, no, I've only owned one. Uh, oh, okay. I've, I've got the I've got Benson Monarch number seventeen. Do you still um, own that one? I it's it's for sale, but I still own it. Oh, okay. Um, I'm looking at it right now. In fact, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I've had uh, I've had some nicer amps. Uh, my my rig before I went digital, if I remember right, was a a big box Cali seventy six with the Lundahl transformer, which goes for like nine hundred bucks now. Yeah. Uh, it's not worth it. And the I think I, I think I went from the Cali seventy six to a uh, Klon KTR to a um, I think it was a I think I was going from that to a Strymon, uh, to a Chase Bliss warped vinyl hi-fi to a Strymon timeline to the Strymon Big Sky. I think, or no, I'd gone to the Ventress uh, source audio by the, uh, the, uh, the source audio Ventress. So that was my rig. It, it was all pretty high end stuff. That's, that's top of the line in every like area. Yeah. So, I mean, mm-hmm. but I mean, like, but you flipped out, like, a lot of it, you flipped up to. So, I mean, that, it's, it's one of those things. Um, do you think that you've personally, like messed with the used market at all? That's a good question. <laughs> well, I, it was a random thought. Like maybe you're the reason I've, why the, the $900 I've, 76s are out there. I've yeah. never thought of that. Um, this became I an can, intervention really fast. No, the, <laughs> <laughs> the Cali 76s. If, if I have, if I have messed with the market, it's that I've generally pushed it down. Hmm. Because if you're looking over um, reverb sales and their price guide, then I've actually had guys when I'm trying to flip something, they throw the reverb price guide in my face and see, well, this just sold for this much. And I go and I'm sitting there going, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I, yeah. I got it for that much. But if um, you ever see like a random reverb price guide where, where there's like one sale, that's like half the price. That's called the Dolhanic effect. That means he just bought something. <laughs> that's not that's not outside of the realm of possibility. Yeah, that's that's very possible. Um, I definitely affected it in the um, Pelican Noiseworks fifty fifty. Um, yeah, you guys were talking about it last episode. That guy that was trying to trade the fifty fifty for like a king of tone or something. Yeah, and yeah, I he, he bought that from me and then tried to. <laughs> tried to flip it back he was, that's right I, we were talking about that i think you were in the inner circle at that point we were talking about it that yeah, might, that, it was you that's who it was yeah it was me yeah yeah so <laughs> when it comes to digital though like i was used to nice stuff and um and so i've you know i flipped you know everything i bought was off the proceeds of flipping um and i don't keep everything i appreciate that you know diaz is selling that pedal for charity. And, and I, I try to be charitable with not just flipping proceeds, but if I have a pedal or a piece of gear, um, there are times where I've, I've tried to be generous to younger players because people were generous to me mm-hmm. when I was a younger player. And I'd encourage anybody who's flipping to find a way to be generous and, uh, and not, not keep a hundred percent of your profits. Um, but, uh, when it comes to going to digital, the story for why I did it was I was at the the most recent Church Collective West Coast Conference, which was last spring of uh, 2018, and I was on stage um, doing doing music for the conference, and there were three electric guitar players on stage, uh, and when I showed up, I just had a, a, a kind of a mini uh, pedal train board, and they said, you know, bring your 
bring your guitar and bring a pedal board and, um, and then we'll, uh, bring a guitar, bring a pedal board, and then, and then uh, we'll plug you into our, one of our amps. I said, cool. And I showed up, and I expected like a Vox AC30 or a Fender Blues Junior, something like that. Yeah, like a basic backline. Yeah, I was just expecting a basic backline tube amp uh, because that's what I had had before. I think the year before I had played through a, a Fender Blues Deluxe. And they said, oh, here, let's show you where you're plugging in. And I walked backstage, and it was a Dr. Z Z-Rec. Hmm. And I was like, wait, this is amazing. I've always wanted to play through this. And in, in their little amp room, it sounds fantastic. It's by far the best amp. And then the other guitar player, uh, is a guy named Rick Matthews, who owns a, a Matthews effects. Mm-hmm. He got the Fender blues deluxe. And then <laughs> the other guitar player is a guy named Chris Bellamy. Who's a, a studio musician. And he had his Kemper with him. And in the front of house and the in-ear monitors, um, I couldn't tell the difference. The the three four thousand dollar Doctor Z amp didn't sound any better than the Fender mass-produced amp, and I couldn't tell the difference with the Kemper. So that got me thinking, and I uh, I bought a Helix and a Kemper from Sweetwater at the same time because I could return one, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I really liked the Helix effects a lot, but the Kemper's, um, amp stuff was so much better that I decided to keep the Kemper and some of my pedals. And then I kind of, uh, supplemented it. I remember actually listening to this podcast and, uh, Diaz had said that you should always get the remote with the Kemper because they're harder to get used. So mm-hmm. I had, I had bought the remote and I had a hybrid pedal board. I was like a, P, a, a pedal train PT junior with the Kemper remote and, um, I kept, uh, I think I was using the Effectrode comp and a, uh, and a Klon KTR and that was it. And then it, all the delays and the reverbs were off the Kemper. Um, and, but I kept missing certain effects, especially the compressors and the, some of the drive effects from the Helix. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I picked up an HX effects because I could sell the remote and sell those pedals and control the Kemper through MIDI with the HX effects and I ended up, you know, making money on the deal because the HX effects was cheaper than selling all the, the parts of my board. And I was really happy with that. I switched to a full helix because I got a, a screaming deal. And this is one of the cool things about being on the gear forums is that you, you get, you build friendships and relationships. And, uh, a guy named Tim Belent messaged me and said, Hey, there's this deal on a website and I know that you've been eyeing a, a full helix. So I ended up getting a brand new helix floor unit, the, the hot, the flagship model for $600 off brand new. Holy oh, wow. crap. Wow. And, and they, it was like 10 people grabbed the deal. They, this, this company in Minnesota had made a mistake and they posted the real deal and put it at the, uh, helix LT price. But they were really cool about it. They honored it. Uh, full Compass Audio. I think they're out of Minnesota. Um, yeah. They were really cool. Their customer service was really excellent. And uh, so the reason I got the Helix was uh, for MIDI control. MIDI control and having the extra um, foot switches was just a, a lot better for what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how I, I got to the rig I have. But the the impetus f- or the thing that pushed me over the edge was realizing that when it came to amplifiers, the Kemper was there and then trying the helix, I realized that the, the effects were so, so good that I could live with, um, I could live with certain things that I miss from analog pedals, not being there for the overall, uh, benefit that I was getting. In the, uh, the helix user interface is actually amazing. Like, um, the, I, I don't know if you've played a head rush, but the head rush has one of the coolest interfaces, but that's cause it's drag and drop and it's a touch screen and all that. But I was a little nervous about going to the, um, using the HX effects because of like adjusting the signal chain, stuff like that. It seemed like it would be tough to learn, but it's actually pretty intuitive. It's, it's surprisingly good. And, um, you know, the guys there's an, uh, from fractal. Uh, like to throw shade and say, you know, oh, the Helix is just a, a pretty screen. 
But that screen matters. It Especially does. if you use a Kemper. The Kemper has a horrible user interface. Mm-hmm. I and agree. you get used to it and you learn how to work with it, but it's not intuitive and it's not easy. And so when you've when you've got something that's incredibly easy to to work with, it's intuitive, um, that makes a way bigger difference than I think some of these builders take into effect. So one uh-huh. of the biggest things that uh, Kemper users have been crying about, or not crying, but I mean crying for like... Yes, we've been crying. Not, well, <laughs> it's not literally crying, but like like they've been crying out for, you know, as a group, is a, uh, like a desktop app, something uh, like a, a user interface that you can control because right now they've got the rig manager which is i mean i don't know how to explain it it's barbaric Wait, compared to does the helix not have a desktop software no it does it does that's what i'm saying like i was about yeah, to say because like line six has always historically had no they've got software. no 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 they it's and it's actually pretty great the hx yeah. edit um they just came out with the 2.7 yeah um it's it's really good like i i enjoy it i I, so i have a laptop that went down and one of the biggest things that i hate doing is having to like set up at my desktop and edit because it's just not i don't have it set up for that to be easy so i wanted to i'm actually fixing my laptop so i can hook up my hx effects and just be able to uh like use that to edit and it's simple and the Kemper just is not simple to edit. It's, it's really a, like a tweaker's delight. Like if you like tweaking every little parameter, but it's just mm-hmm. so tough because you have to move page to page and it's a small LCD screen that you're using. And it's not as intuitive as the, the Helix. And that I've actually thought about going to the full Helix floor model and still having my Kemper, but like, just kind of using that more and so i could go and just plug in and do that just because the software is so much easier to use the 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 interface on the full kemper floor model is so good that you can get away without using the hx edit the hx mm-hmm. edit is better and it's easier but not by much just they because really, you can drag and they, drop like that's probably the easiest thing is because you yes. can drag and drop things other that's, than other than drag and drop they really did it right the, yeah and the HX effects and I and the HX stomp prob- would would really you know the edit software works out great for it because you don't have that giant screen, but the yeah. floor model just it's it seems amazing. It's it's really good, and I I think that um, that's that's it's just it's that kind of workflow the ability to to do stuff on stage cuz a lot of the stuff that these things are designed for they're either designed for studios or mm-hmm. they're designed for people to do all the work ahead of time and then go play live but that's not how live music works yeah. and that's always one of the big problems where um when the when the iPhone first came out you couldn't text pictures and the Apple engineers all said well why would you need to you can just email pictures and that's great if you work at Apple and everybody has iPhones and everybody's family has iPhones because they work at Apple. Mm-hmm. But my mom, her little flip phone can't get email mm-hmm. and I need to be able to text her a picture. And so, so it's, that, it's that lack of imagination to, that somebody could want to use my, my product for something beyond what I've thought of. And, um, and all of these companies are guilty of it. Line six seems to be able to see past it better than most. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the good, so here's one of the things too. So we're supposed to try to persuade Chris, um, to go digital. So he, one of my, one of my new like arguments now that I'm using like the HX effects, because I, at first I was really kind of nervous about going digital with my uh compressor well with my compressor and my drive but like when you think about it think of like your favorite guitar tones on an album it's it's been digitized it's not like you're just getting a raw recording like everyone's like oh we'll just plug straight into a marshall and it'll sound great it's like okay if you're going for this sound like it's especially with a lot of newer stuff 
it's not like they just recorded like through the pedal board into the amp and that was it. They add effects afterwards. They add compression to that track and all that. And I think like if you just get past the fact of number one, you're, you've got like all these analog pedals or like half of your quote unquote analog pedals aren't fully analog anymore. That's a big, big part too. Like, think about like people are flipping out about the line six like oh it just sounds so digital da, 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 da. like okay but if you look at your board the last two things on your pedal that your chain's going through is a timeline and a big sky which are just computers in a big box mm-hmm. and you've you've got that running into the front of an amp which it's not it's not even like a clean amp it's almost dirty and you're putting your delays and reverbs into that anyways you shouldn't be trusted with tone in my opinion but like you're running through digital anyways why not just go all the way and just make it easier on yourself i agree with that um the the other thing is the cost the the price point is the biggest thing i hear I think people have. I think. I think a majority of players have come to terms with the fact that all the things that Diaz just said is true, and then price point comes into play, and they say, "Well, the the Helix Floor, the main flagship one, is." I think they just dropped the price because of the stomp, so it's now fifteen hundred dollars. But if you have a stri- if you have the Strifecta, the Mobius, the Timeline, and the Big Sky, that's fifteen hundred. About fifteen hundred right there. Yes, and and so well, when you think about. The, yeah, the way mean, they how, justify it is because they're piecing it together. Yeah. Bro, yeah, you don't Z, it all at once. Z sounds 12 months, same as cash. You just pay 20 bucks for processing. There you go. You're splitting it up. Yeah. Like, who, like, why? I mean, the only reason why you have nice pedals is people are like, well, I save and I buy. So, so you kind of flip or you're, you're adding value as you go, adding cash to deals and stuff like that. But, if you think about the money that you're spending on shipping pedals, um, if you lose money on a deal, if you buy a pedal new because you can afford that one and then you sell it used and buy the one you want, all the money you're cycling through, you might as well just buy something big and nice and just do it. Sell your pedal board. You, you're running a $4,000 pedal board into a $500 amp anyways. Just sell some stuff. Yeah, it, it it's it's really more cost effective than people realize. And this is me and yelling at a year ago, Diaz. By the way, this is me getting hateful because <laughs> this because everything I'm saying is exactly what someone would be saying to me a year ago. And that's understandable. I mean, I first bought a Line Six Pod XT Live, um, like I don't know, 2004 or something like that when I first bought it, and it it, it was had some cool things, but it. You know, people would say, oh, it's just as good. And it wasn't. Um, and, I, and I think like the pod HD 500 and some of those things, like they were good for what they were. Mm-hmm. But there was this you kept hearing people say, oh, it's just as good. You can, and and it, no, it wasn't. No. And no. you have to get over that prejudice of previous products. The Line 6 Spider is terrible, but the Line 6 Helix is not. Well, okay, yeah. and even then, the D L look at look at all the good stuff Line Six made. That was a staple. The cool thing that one of the things that I didn't realize until I really like b- before I, until I like bought the H X F X and was investigating, it has all of those pedals, the, the, like the legacy stuff. That's literally one of the ca- what the category is called is legacy stuff they've already put out that was amazing back then. Think about the whole the 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 four series the dl4 mm4 all that stuff that was were staples on people's boards during like the music that you absolutely loved Mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of people still use the dl4 and then the mm4 so if a person's saying like why should i do this i actually would say some people shouldn't um somebody who's new like a, a a newer guitar player a younger guitar player, I think shouldn't. I think they should do a basic startup board. Um, you mm-hmm. know, for for three hundred bucks, you can do Pedal Train Nano, a one spot power supply, and patch cables for a hundred bucks. 
50 bucks for a tuner, 50 bucks for an overdrive, like a, a soul food or a boss SD one, mm-hmm. um, boss DD seven with a tap for like a hundred bucks. That's 300 bucks. Yeah. And, and that's a good starting place because as much gear as I've gone through, there are still things with the helix that it feels like too much options for me. And I don't yeah. fully understand some of the controls. Um, and I think if you're a brand new player or if you're new to gear, you maybe you started as an acoustic player and you're switching, it could easily overwhelm you. Well, and the helix is, we talked about it being intuitive is it's set up like for someone who's been messing with pedals before. Like yeah, that's another thing too. Like, like you've got like on the HX effects, like the drive, the mint, the mintar, minotar, mint. I don't know why I said mintar. Sorry. Minotar. It, there's three knobs. It's got a, you know, the, the tone gain, all that stuff. And the three knobs match somewhere. So it's like messing with a pedal. And you, I mean, if you're going to jump in straight to that, I'd agree. Don't do it. That it'd be, it'd be a lot that you don't understand too. It's kind of like whenever your first car is a Porsche, (laughs) well, maybe not a Porsche. We'll say a Beamer. Definitely not a Honda Civic. (laughs) It's It's no Honda Civic. It's well, one of some, <laughs> yeah, in some ways, like if your first car has like no, you know, you're just focused on driving. Yeah. Um, whereas like my, I just bought a new car and it, it's a computer. What'd you, um, what'd you start off with when you flipped up? <laughs> He's like, I, start, <laughs> I, I started with a 1989 Pinto. This is my new Lamborghini. <laughs> no, I, I, flipped no. For it. I wish I could flip cars. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so I think a, a younger player or a less experienced player should start analog. And there's probably players for whom it makes a lot of sense to stay analog. Um, but I think uh, for a lot of us now, things the, the the technology has gotten to the place where if you were at a church player and you have an amp room, and even non-church players, you go to venues and they have an amp room somewhere, then there's no difference. Um, and, and I'll say that the... The Line 6 Power Cab and some of these uh, FRFRs, they're good enough. I plugged in the, the Kemper to the Power Cab, and it was, it was great. sounded fantastic. So, so we're getting there, mm-hmm. and we have gotten there in a lot of areas with the technology that um, I could see. You, know, you asked if I had messed with the used pedal market. I can see digital platforms affecting the market, um, mm-hmm. and, and I'm a little concerned about that for from my own personal standpoint there's a and there's been like a big push um i'm i don't know if it's just my feed it's probably because i just joined a helix group or something like that but like that's all i'm seeing (laughs) and i I might just be like self-aware um now it's like oh gosh i'm one of them but uh (laughs) it seems like there's a big push all the way around you know it was a thing too i was expecting to join the helix group and see people like just praise and worship people and stuff there's a lot of like heavy gigging musicians who are using these digital products and a lot of it's based on reliability as well yeah i mean there you know you're gonna hear the stories of like my kemper went down during a gig it's gonna happen but you're also you do, you also don't hear that much because it's it's an accepted common thing. I blew a tube during the first song. Something happens happened. all the time. VP Junior string broke, and now I need to buy a four hundred dollar volume pedal because I don't want to spend five dollars and fix it. Yeah, and that and that's and that's the thing. Um, it'll be interesting to see if all of these I'm selling everything to get a Helix uh, people in a year or so decide to sell the helix oh, and I've restart the pedal board. I've seen it. I've seen the, I've seen the will trade helix for a fully loaded pedal board. Yeah. Um, that, that's an interesting question, but uh, it's, it's there. I think it really comes down to open and closed systems, Chris. Like if you, if you, as the hypothetical, I'm thinking about going digital, uh, a helix or a Kemper or a fractal is a, is a, mostly closed system they have Mm -hmm. um fx loops so that you can if you have your favorite pedal you can still use that with the helix or the kemper Mm -hmm. but if you prefer 
having a modular pedal board so that you can switch pedals in and out and you enjoy that, um, there's no reason to switch. You're, you're, you're having a good time and you're, you're enjoying life. Like, great. The, if you don't mind being in a mostly closed system, I'm using whatever line six gives me, I'm using whatever Kemper or the aftermarket community give me, then, uh, you'll find the benefits are, are there for you, but it's just a question of preference. Yeah, I was a little nervous about going HX effects mostly because, like you said, there's that closed system. It's like, am I willing to trust every sound I want? But the th- good thing about these digital platforms, too, is they could expand. That's like uh, the everyone's waiting on the new reverbs for from Kemper to come out. You can add to it, and that's a cool thing, too. Then it's like getting a new pedal for free. And the thing I'll say about line six is there are so many different sounds. I don't think there's something that you like won't be able to find except for a polyphonic tracking. Cause yeah, and, and, yeah. and that could happen soon. Yeah. And that's another yeah. thing too. It can, it can come to fruition. It can happen. Like if they work on it, it, that'll be the thing honestly out of all, line six is the one i expect to see a lot of new stuff from kemper not so much because christoph apparently thinks it's perfect the way it is yeah um that that is the the challenge of uh, some of this stuff because um like like when it comes to the digital stuff and you're thinking about it you start talking like what's the best one and there is not a best all in one yet. I think yeah. Helix is probably the best all in one, the full Helix, but the amp models are not as good and, and and this morning I was trying to dial in some amp stuff with the Helix and it was fine, it was usable. Um the but Kemper then I, I turned that one. then I turned the Kemper on uh and it was oh, nope, that's it. That's a real amp. Um but Helix seems to be really okay where where it's at. And Kemper, like you were just saying, is really okay with where it's at. Mm-hmm. So it um, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen anytime soon. I think it's just a question of what you're going to be doing with it. Like um, if you are looking for more of a pedal board solution, Line 6 or Fractal, if you're looking for more of an amplifier than Kemper or maybe Fractal, mm-hmm. um, the, you know, or... or or pedal boards, the head rush or the, uh, there's the, the boss has don't, theirs. Don't do the, don't do the head rush. No, I'm not advising <laughs> it, but you know, yeah, uh, I, I'm that understanding. Was, I definitely, that was one that I plugged into and it was just kind of depressing. It yeah, was but not, we, pl- we play live. Like I know we're not gigging musicians, but we do play live. Yeah. And, um, you know, I could see for bedroom warriors where they are just saying, you know, I don't want to put that kind of money into something right now. Yeah, that's, I don't have a problem with that. Head rush, head rush is more. Yeah, I think that would be like if you if you were to be a brand new guitar player and you'd want something digital like that, I'd say the head rush is the way to go. But the I don't know. I just I thought it left a lot to be lacking. the The effects weren't great. The amp models weren't great. I mean, it was it was it was kind of like eating. SpaghettiOs and that has meatballs on it, but you don't really like the meatballs, but you take them out and deal with it. Yeah. That's what <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just open to the, the if idea. That, so I, if that makes sense to anyone. Yeah. So I, Oh, it makes sense to me. Chris, Chris, what's like if from a person who does like almost all analog stuff, what's uh-huh. the biggest like thing that would stop you from going digital? I think my biggest thing has always been like the feel and touch that you can get with like an analog like amp. So like if I'm plugging into I like Marshall or Vox that's got some gain on it. Um, you know, am I going to be able to turn my volume down on my guitar and get the same effect with the digital system as much as I can with the analog or what? Yes. I would say, well, definitely with Kemper. Kemper has yes. amazing response to any change. Um, Kim, if you're if you're worried, if you're more worried about your amp situation, Kemper is definitely the the place you need to start. Um, Most like drives, even though I know like the Helix has like what six, okay. 
four or six okay the helix has loops the all right so the i'll say this i i feel that the helix has the better drives by far Mm. and but the thing that is amazing about the kemper is there's a lot of profiles that are profiled with drive pedals in front of them that sound great in my opinion um yeah like you there's the most common ones are you've got a synth like a clon in front of it um a king of tone in front of it and the cool thing about those two with the different profiles are they a a good pro company that profiles are good group like tone junkies um sailor sounds they do it at different gain stages as well so with Mm -hmm. the kemper if you're going to adjust the gain on the kemper is when you start getting away from the really natural amp feel because it sounds best at what it was profiled at. And Which makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and then whenever you change your gain and you're changing these parameters, it's kind of using formulas to say, well, it would probably sound like this. But it's guessing. Yeah. I, I think if, because you, um, you do the Green Day cover band, right? Yeah. And then you do church stuff, right? Correct. So if you're, if you're doing like, if you had my setup or, or, or Diaz's setup is pretty similar. If you have a Helix and then you have a, a Kemper, um, you set up a song, uh, for your, you know, you you set up, um, a basket case, uh, by Green Day and you can either just set up a basic generic Green Day rig and use snapshots and presets to to switch sounds or you can just set up for a song and say for this song um this is what billy joel was using and i'm just going to go verse chorus second verse bridge you know however you want yeah and um i i love some of the gain uh amplifier sounds um Mm -hmm. and uh and sometimes you know uh the overdrive isn't the way to go um because what we're doing as analog players is we have a a a platform with our amplifier and we have it kind of set to cover a lot of different bases, but none of them a hundred percent instead of saying like my, my go to church rig. Um, I have a clean tone, which is a, um, it's based off of a, uh, it's based off of a Princeton, but the, the Tyler amps version of the Princeton. And then, um, my delay tone is a AC 30 profile with the vintage silver bell, uh, speakers, and then mm-hmm. my drive tone is it switches it it it's a right now it's a cranked AC30, um, and before that it was a um, an orange thunder verb, so so it gives you a lot of options. And then on, I have like a modulated like a chorus uh, Johnny Marr kind of sound, and I'm using a, a Milkman Creamer profile. So so you could switch between all that, and, and as a gigging musician, uh, it's not about the drives as much as it's about the amps. And then you can just switch between here. You know, here's my here's my rigs for uh, for the the Green Day cover band. Here's my rigs for church, um, and then I'm ready to go. It's 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 incredibly versatile uh, for for the gigging musician. Yeah, yeah. So buy one, Chris, so we can win the argument. <laughs> Marissa, hurry up, get on reverb, go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, that's, like, always been my hold back too, is, like, I was, like, I had the M-Series Line 6 stuff, so, like, I'm already, and, like, I think you made the uh, comparison with, like, the Strymon stuff, it's, like, I've already been doing, like, 50% digital on everything. Yeah. Go all the way since i've like started playing so i think i think i think you listen now I, i'm a firm believer i think everyone should run hx effects with the kemper and that's the that's where the that's where the tone's at because <laughs> i run and i run the four four cable method so everything's all set up nice and fancy yeah and honestly yeah, the right. drives and the line six pedals the the hx line they're just phenomenal. Yeah, I'll yeah, definitely you, have to give it a try next time, like we see each other, since you have the helix. It's it's worth doing. Um, and and then when you have both, it gives you flexibility because, uh, you know, I can take the helix for like, um, if I was doing like a I don't know a youth camp, church yeah, youth and camp you don't or feel something. Like bringing the camper. 
Yeah, and I just don't want to mess with it. I just bring the helix. Um, oh, yeah. Now I need a the- full size helix. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jeff. You do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> She's actually going to come in here. She's going to be like, what? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> Love it. You'll I'm see. Not I'm not Adam says nothing. I need a helix. She's gonna be like, "Well, Adam says that you need to go sleep on his couch." I'm like, "He's in Portland. I'd love to go." <laughs> it's like, okay, I've wanted to go right, to the well, Pacific uh, Northwest. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Adam, for joining us. I know we've uh, we've just hit the hour mark, so I know we all got stuff to do because we kind of got a little late start tonight. So yeah, definitely, welcome. thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and you can um, check out uh, Adam on the Church Collective podcast, and uh, you could always send him a random friend request and find things for sale. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you want to, uh, the, the Church Collective podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. And uh, my blog, realworldworship.org, is where you can find out uh, the truth about JHS pedals. And Truth we'll bomb. hopefully have Damn. those links down below too. Uh, I can't believe you'll get them sent to me. But well, that'll be next time you have me on. <laughs> yes, next time we're gonna next the next uh, episode with Adam will be pedal building conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> Four oh part goodness. episode. All right. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that would be the day. We'll just right. we'll make those our holiday specials. <laughs> oh my gosh, Halloween's next week. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> All right, so uh, I also want to thank uh, Stringjoy for sponsoring this episode. Uh, like we said at the beginning, uh, they do custom strings, half gauges, uh, and they also help you figure out what gauge will work for your particular guitar and what kind of like feel you're going for. They can wind your G. They can not wind your G. Whatever you're down or with, They can G. unwind it. Yeah, well, whatever you want to do with your G, uh, they'll do it. Keep it real, G. <laughs> Nothing but a G thing. Ain't nothing yeah. but a G thing. Oh, okay. So, all right. He has a singing rap song. That means it is yeah, time so to stop. We're going to try to wrap this up. So thank you all for joining us. Make <laughs> sure you leave us a review on iTunes. Follow us on Instagram at The Effects Loop. Uh, join our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash The Effects Loop. Uh, if you haven't followed us on YouTube, the link will be down below because we have not hit that threshold that we get to have the custom URL. Um mm-hmm. But we did publish our Lambertones demo last week, so go check that out if you haven't already. And you can also email us at theeffectsloop at gmail.com. And I think that does it. So for the effects loop, I'm Chris. I'm Marissa. I'm Diaz. And I'm Adam. And we will see you guys next week. All right, see you guys. Bye, guys. Bye.